credentialed diabetes educator. I'm also a trained intensive care nurse as well. I'm, as you've heard, I'm passionate about diabetes technology, mainly because I've lived with type 1 diabetes myself for 24 years. Okay, so I have a vested interest in these advancements because I personally benefit from them as well. I've worked as a nurse both here in Australia and in the UK. And as you can see down the bottom, I'm also the paediatric coordinator for hybrid closed loop technology trials. So we've just finished the hybrid closed loop technology trial with the Medtronic 670G, and we're just starting the advanced hybrid closed loop study with a version of the Medtronic 780. So if there are any 12 to 24 year olds in the room with a HbA1c greater than 9%, hit, hit me up, uh, you might be eligible for the study. Okay, so you heard a little bit about Banting and Best just before. As I, I tried to dress in blue as well for World Diabetes Day. <laughs> so insulin was discovered, I've said 1921, did say 1922, so some contention already. It was first, insulin was commercially produced in 1923 and it was initially <coughs> extracted from bovine and porcine pancreases, so pig and cow pancreases. And that was the main form of insulin until the late 20th century. Uh, we got human insulin, uh, which is made with recombinant DNA technology in the 1980s. And up until the 70s, the main way of measuring blood glucose level was via urine dipstick. Okay, so we've seen advancing technology. We've got blood glucose monitors, we've got advancing pumps, and we're moving into continuous glucose monitors potentially taking over. Little fun fact for everyone. The first person or child in Australia to receive Australian made insulin was just over the river, up the road at the Women's and Children's Hospital. Little six year old boy in 1923. So we do pretty well in South Australia. We have come a long way with technology in the last 40 years. So just looking at insulin pump therapy, the one on the left, your left, was one of the first insulin pumps, okay? Nice small little thing, just a, a backpack. <laughs> um, so yeah, just strap that on and off you go. It needed intravenous lines in your arm, so it wasn't subcutaneous like current pumps. And now we've got these little devices that can fit in your pocket. So the technology has advanced considerably over the last 40 years. And you, I think if you were diagnosed today, you're you're quite fortunate because we do have quite, quite good technology available to us to, to manage diabetes. There's lots of tech, okay? I need to limit what I'm talking about and generally this presentation is just going to be a brief overview for everybody. I am not going to be delving into a lot of detail, otherwise you'd be strapped to your chairs for hours. What I'm going to focus on mainly is pumps, CGM and flash and artificial pancreas or hybrid closed loop technology. I like to throw this slide in uh, just because I personally feel the media has a lot of sway with people and their expectations of technology. So it's important, the orange line's reality and people with high expectations are often quite disappointed with technology. It doesn't meet their expectations. Those with modest expectations do tend to do better uh, and are happier with the technology. So. One of my roles as a CDE is to help modulate people's expectations and align it, their expectations with the reality of what the technologies can deliver. So they're not disappointed. Now, we also do find people who haven't learned maladaptive behaviours, and I don't know, I'm guilty of this as well, fake carving, uh, rage bolusing, those sort of things. <laughs> don't tend to do as well with new technology because we've got to unlearn those maladaptive behaviours before we can actually use that technology appropriately. And we're really seeing that with hybrid closed loop technology because we're letting the pumps take over some of the work or do a lot of the work for us, we're having to take a step back and some people do struggle with that letting go. So continuous glucose monitoring, I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with the technology or use the technology? A few hands popping up. Yeah, oh, quite a few. Very good, very good. So this hopefully isn't new uh, information for you, but generally the way I like to talk about CGM technology is when you eat some carbohydrate, 
your body breaks that down into glucose and that glucose moves into the bloodstream. You can then measure that with a blood glucose level, okay? So as you can see, the sensor sits in the interstitial space. So it does take a little bit of time for that glucose to move from the bloodstream into that interstitial space for it to be read by the sensor, okay? It's just a limitation of the technology. Now, a lot of sensors or sensors have become more accurate over time. Now, if anybody remembers back to the first Medtronic sensor, the, the real time, it was a beast of a little thing, almost took up half your tummy with the transmitter. Um, they weren't very accurate, but as we've expanded over the last five, 10 years, we've got sensors now that have a MARD, they're approaching 10 or less than 10%, okay? So a MARD is a measure of accuracy. Blood glucose level MARD ranges from five to 20%. So, and a lot of modern CGMs now have a MARD of less than 10. So we are talking about these devices being quite accurate, okay? Now, we are on the cusp of CGM replacing blood glucose monitoring, just like, as I said, in 1970, when blood glucose monitoring replaced urine, test, urine glucose testing. Now, the other important thing to mention is a lot of these new CGMs, because they're so accurate, they are able to drive these uh, hybrid closed loop systems as well. So we're relying on these sensors to augment the insulin delivery for us, okay? So we do need to know that they're accurate, and, and they are. So what are some benefits of continuous or flash glucose monitoring? Big thing is the benefits relate to how often you wear it. So we need to wear our CGM roughly 70% of the time. This is what the literature says to get the benefits from it. Now I liken CGM or just glucose monitoring to wearing a blindfold. So I don't know if anyone's seen Bird Box on Netflix, but that's my little reference there. So currently, or those that self-monitor blood glucose level, you've literally, you're wearing a blindfold. You take that blindfold off, you measure your glucose level, you're putting a blindfold back on until you do that next blood glucose level. And you have no idea what's happening in between. Those blood glucose levels might all be in, in target range, but you don't know if you're bouncing up and down in between, okay? The benefit of CGM technology is it's gonna show you the whole picture. You're gonna get a reading up to every five minutes, so that's 288 readings per day. That's a lot of information. Now, I feel the benefit is in seeing. So if you see something, then you can do something about it. If you fix something, then you can, as a result, get improved glycemic control. Okay, so it's quite powerful, this technology. Now, we do see as well a greater hemoglobin A1C reduction if you start with a higher HbA1c. So if you start with a HbA1c of say seven, you might see a modest reduction, say down into the high sixes if you use CGM technology. If you start with a HbA1c of 10, you might see a reduction, say down to 8%. Okay, so the, the benefit is greater if your HbA1c is higher. Now, just a little bit of information for you as well. With CGM technology, there's a reduction in DKA-related hospitalizations. But there's also a reduction in hypos as well because of that visibility. So we also see that reduced variability, the ups and the downs, that improved time in range in the A1C. Now, in the US, there was a study that was done, uh, hypo-related hospitalizations cost $54 million. And people who, had, who start using CGM, it results in a cost saving of $11 million, And that's roughly $1,200 per year per, per patient. And if you think about the way CGM subsidised in Australia, that's a considerable, considerable, considerable portion of the amount of money that would go towards funding these devices for people with type one diabetes or diabetes in general. Okay. Now, a few of our learnings. Now, a lot of these are related to paediatrics, unfortunately, because that's where I work. Now, with the advent of CGM, so it was, think back April 2017, the rollout of the continuous glucose monitoring subsidy was first announced. We just hit the ground running. We did CGMs after CGMs after CGMs. That was all we did for a very long time. Now, the traditional message was you give your insulin and you could eat straight away, okay? We thought that was fine because we didn't see those spikes post meals because you weren't testing every five minutes to see it. Now, we put CGMs on these kids, and then we're like, wow, we're getting these huge glycemic spikes 
post meals. So the message that we had to change was basically these rapid acting insulins aren't as fast as we think they are. So we need to pre-bolus. So give the insulin 10 to 15 minutes before we eat. And as a result, you can see in the bottom one, we reduce that variation or that variability. Okay. This is the same, this is the same kid. Okay. And all we did was just get the kid to give insulin 10 to 15 minutes earlier. Vast, vast improvement. So as you can see, straight away, less variability and improvement in the time in range. Now, I know for some people, pre-bolusing is a bit of a, a sticking point. I do struggle sometimes as well. So we are getting faster insulins as well. So we've got ultra fast acting insulin. So the main one we've got at the moment is FIASP, okay? The benefit of FIASP is you can give the insulin and then eat straight away within zero to five minutes of giving that dose of insulin. Now, it is dose equivalent to your usual Humalog and Nova Rapid dose. So if you use five units of Humalog, you give five units of FIASP. Now, it isn't approved for automated insulin dosing system. So if you're using hybrid closed loop, FIASP isn't tested in these systems. So the main audience would be people on multiple daily injections at the moment. They will test FIASP for these hybrid closed loop systems, but until then we can't say it can be used in them. The other thing that we found was hypo treatments was we're basically over treating hypos. So with the advent of CGM, we we're able to see it. So if we could see it, we could use it as an education point to show people that they, what, they, what was occurring. Now in paediatrics, and I've got to stress this is paediatrics, the ISPAD guidelines recommend 0 0.3 grams of fast acting carbohydrate per kilo of body weight. So three grams per 10 kilos of body weight. That is the current recommendation. So can, you can imagine if you've got, We've got a four-year-old kid. You're not going to be giving them 15 grams of carbohydrate for a hypo treatment. They'll go from 3.8, they'll be up at 20. So it's important to tailor that hypo treatment and individualise it. So the thing is, people that are wearing CGM might have found they can reduce their hypo treatments. Okay, So you might have reduced it from, say, that traditional 15 grams down to 10 or 12 grams to limit that rebound hypoglycemia above 10 millimoles, okay? Now, I don't know if anybody's done that or seen that, yeah? But basically, start with your 15 and just reduce it down until you don't spike again. Now, limitations of the technology. So there's always pros and cons. Now, the big thing, as you remember in that slide with the sensor, the sensors are not measuring blood glucose, okay? So they are measuring in different places, so don't expect them to give the same reading, okay? That, that's the first important point. They're measuring in different places, you don't want them to read the same, okay? And again, that comes down to expectations of the technology. A lot of people will say that, oh, the, the sensor's measuring my blood glucose level, it's not measuring the interstitial glucose. So you've got that lag time between the glucose moving from the blood to that interstitial space. So that lag is roughly six to 12 minutes, generally, but some people might find that time frame shorter. Newer CGMs, they've improved the algorithms and the Dexcom G6 is reported to have a lag time of only four minutes, okay? I liken, it to a roller coaster, which you can see in the pictures. So if you think you've got your blood glucose in the front carriage, your sensor's in the back carriage. You eat some carbohydrate, your blood glucose is gonna rise first. That sensor will lag behind. It's the same when your glucose level is falling. You might actually find your, you might feel your hypo symptoms, but the sensor's still telling you you're in target range, okay? So that's why it's still important to treat. If you, I do like the, uh, the AMSL mantra, if in doubt, get your meter out. Okay, so if your signs, if your symptoms don't match what the readings say, do a blood glucose check. And I still recommend to people, if you're having a hypo and you're treating your hypo, please use a blood glucose level, okay? Because of that inherent lag time with the sensor, it increases the risk of you over-treating a hypo, 
if you're basing it off a sensor glucose level. Okay. Now, a few other things. Paracetamol, vitamin C interference. You may know Medtronic Dexcom sensors, there's a paracetamol interference. It is reduced with a Dexcom G6, as long as you're not going over one gram of paracetamol every six hours. Now, interestingly, the Libre has a vitamin C interference, if anybody knew that. So it's more than 500 milligrams of vitamin C. Does anybody know how many oranges that is? <laughs> seven oranges, just over seven oranges. I can't imagine anyone would eat that <laughs> in one sitting. Now, some of you as well might have seen the effect of compression lows as well. So the glucose concentration in muscle is lower than the interstitial space. And if you have a, a sensor, say, in your arm and your, your bottom or arm, tummy, wherever it is, and you lay on it and that sensor is pushed closer to muscle, you see this sharp drop in the glucose or the sensor glucose. That is essentially that sensor is being pushed close to muscle. Okay, and then you roll over and it shoots back up again. Okay, so it's called a compression low and it's just physiological where the, the sensor is sitting and where it's being pushed. Okay, now skin irritations is another, I call it a limitation. We do see quite a lot of skin irritations in paediatrics related to devices, so both pumps and CGM. And as we start wearing more of these technology devices, it is becoming more apparent as well. Okay. Um, if anybody has serious issues, you can chat with me afterwards and we can talk through some options. Okay, so current CGMs that we've got on the market. So unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them all individually, and that's why the reps are here. Okay, so if you're interested in any of these devices, please have a chat with them after uh, or in the break. But essentially, we've got the Freestyle Libre, which is the, the only flash glucose monitor. It does last the longest, it's a 14 day wear time. Doesn't need calibrations, just like the Dexcom G6 doesn't need calibrations. And Librate, you have to scan to get the reading. Okay, it isn't continuous. All the others are continuous. So the bottom left, you've got the Guardian 3. Top, you've got the Guardian Connect. They're both from Medtronic. And you've got Dexcom G5 and G6 in the middle. So those four on the left are continuous. The Libre is the flash. Okay, so it's not continuous. Okay, they have various wear times from seven to 10 days. G6, as I said, doesn't need a calibration, but you can calibrate it still. Uh, all the others need at least minimum two calibrations per day. That's all I'll talk about. There's Louis again, okay, just in case I was losing anybody. That was the day we went swimming. <laughs> okay. So, time in range. Now, some of you may or may not have heard of time in range. Okay, it is a new metric that is starting to become embedded in clinical practice. It's derived from our continuous and flash glucose monitors. Now, as you can see in the picture, our aim is to spend roughly 70% of the time between a target range of 3.9 and 10 millimoles per litre. That is the ideal. It is important to individualise this, so it depends on your starting point. So if you're starting with a timing range of 20%, you might just aim for 25%. So small achievable goals. Don't go from 20 and aim for 70 because you'll set yourself up to fail. Now, people who may have hyper one awareness, they, you might just aim for a 60% timing range. So just work with your healthcare professionals to identify an achie achievable target for yourselves. So this is an international consensus guideline. So a lot of diabetes professionals all sat around a big table, kind of like what you guys were doing now, and agreed that these, this was the definition for time in range. Okay, there isn't a lot of literature to back it up, but this was the consensus. Now it's also important to talk about the time above and below range as well. Time above range, we want to spend less than 25% of our time above 10, and ideally less than 5% above 13.9. Okay, so that's our extreme hyperglycemia. Also our time below range, so less than 4% below 3.9 and less than 1% below 3.0. 3 
So, most of you are familiar with hemoglobin A1c. So is there a link between the two? Now, with this slide, Beck and colleagues, they reworked the seminal DCC trial data. So it was a massive big study uh, back last century now. And they basically looked at complications from diabetes management. Now, unfortunately, when they did the study, there wasn't any CGM. So what they did is extrapolate the data from the poor individuals who did lots of blood glucose testing during the study. And what they found was that there's an inverse linear relationship, which you can see you've got HbA1c and time in range plotted, and they do follow each other. So there's, there is a relationship between the two. So basically, a higher time in range, you've got a lower A1c and vice versa. So if you just sort of map it out, high HbA1c, find where a high HbA1c is plotted, it equates to a low time in range and vice versa. So a lower A1c of, say, 6 will equate to a, a higher time in range. So there is a link between the two. Okay. So which one do we use? <laughs> okay. Now, HbA1c isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. Okay. It is still an important clinical measure. But it measures average glucose. Okay. And it is a measure, it's essentially a measure of hyperglycemia. That, that's its function. Okay. Time in range looks at everything. It looks at the ups, the highs, the lows, the variability, and the intra, the day-to-day -day variations as well within that. And as you can see, you can have, in the three pictures, you've got three people doing completely different things, but they've got the same A1C, because A1C is only an average. If you've got lots of highs and lots of lows, it's going to average out to a pretty nice A1C. But if you've got someone who's sailing along at time in range 100%, they too will have an A1C. Okay? So it only tells, tells you part of the picture. Okay? That's why time in range is so powerful, because it shows you everything. It shows you your time in range, time above and below range. And like I said, if you see the visibility, gives you the power to then do something about it. Okay? Now, also, HbA1C difficult to get done and I don't know about people in the room sometimes you may not get it done for six or eight months okay timing range is an easier metric to yes mate uh, what's the range you're showing in green? it's the, the standard the, the consensus guidelines 3.9 to 10 yeah yeah so it is in milligrams per deciliter just on the side so it's American sorry <laughs> now A1Cs are hard to do. I don't know about adult world, but in paediatrics, we can just do a finger prick to measure a HbA1C. A lot of you will still need to do a phlebotomy to have blood taken, which isn't nice. Okay. So time in range is a lot more accessible, and it is easier to understand as well. Now, if anybody wants to know as well, the way you convert A1C to an average glucose level you double your A1C and you're minus six. That will convert your A1C to an average glucose level, if anybody's curious. A lot of people do confuse their A1C with an average glucose, so they think, oh, my A1C is eight, but my glucose level's eight. It's not. Yes? So you, <laughs> you double the A1C and you're minus six from it. That'll convert your A1C to an average glucose. So you double it and you're minus six. That'll give, that'll give you an average glucose level from your A1C. You double the A1C and you take six from it. Yeah, cool. So a lot of people confuse their A1C with an average glucose level. So you say, oh, yeah, A1C is eight, my average glucose level is eight. A1C is a, it's measured as a percentage of the average glucose for the last three months. Every time your, your body makes a red blood cell, there's a bit of glucose attached to it. And that's what we're measuring. Those red blood cells last for three months. So we're measuring the average glucose from the last three months. Okay? So that, to convert it to a glucose level, you double it and minus six. So for you guys, you go, oh, that's all well and good, but what does it actually mean? So time in range, 70%. You're spending roughly 16.8 hours of a day in target range. And I've got to thank Medtronic for those little snippets that I pinched. 
every increase in time in range is important. So if you can increase your time in range by 4%, you're spending a whole nother day, uh, no, a whole nother hour in range, and you're spending 15 days a year extra in range. So that'll have impacts on less highs, less lows. You'll feel better too. So improve quality of life. Okay. If you can get your time in range up by 10%, that equates to a rough A1C improvement of 0.8%. Some studies say 0.5, some say 0.8, but it's roughly a 0.8% increase. It is very important to look at the time below range as well as your time in range, because that signifies your hypoglycemia risk. So if you've got an A1C of 6.2, you've got 80% time in range, but you're spending 10% of the time below range, you're at a significant risk for adverse events. Okay, So it still is very important to look at that time below range as well. So a lot of you probably already know this, but the, da the literature does show that time in range is important to people. Okay, So we've mapped type, people with type 1, people with type 2 on insulin, and people with type 2 not using insulin. And everybody ranks time in range as the second most important thing to them. Okay, So it shows that it's a valuable tool. And I think it's the ease of access and ease of understanding that help people, um, that make it more valuable to people. So where do you find your time in range? So if you're using your Medtronic 640 or 670, it's found on your pump. So just follow through into your options menu. Uh, 770, you'll be able to find it on the pump and on the app. Okay, If you're interested, have a chat with the reps. Guardian Connect, which is the standalone Medtronic, you'll find it via the app. Dexcom, you'll find it through the Clarity app. And the Libre, you'll find through the Libre app as well. So just some examples you can see there. The Medtronic pumps on the left. And then you've got the Dexcom. So if you're using Dexcom system link with Clarity, so not everyone may have the Clarity app downloaded if they're using a Dexcom system, but it's a really cool app. Okay, So it can send you push notifications at the end of the week to say, hey, you've spent this much time in range. There's X, Y patterns as well. And then the Libre on the right. So you just toggle through the menus and it'll show you what your time in range is. Really important, make sure your time in range targets are set to 3.9 to 10. They don't all default to that. So you may be... Um, doing yourself a disservice if you don't adjust them. Uh, you might actually be doing better than you think you are. Just make sure that your time in range targets are set between 3.9 and 10 on whatever app or device you're using because they don't all default to that international consensus target. Uh, and you might yeah, be doing yourself a disservice. So you might be doing better than you think you are. So what are some barriers to using time in range? The biggest one's the cost. Not everyone's funded for CGM, unfortunately. So we've got selected groups that are funded. So kids under 21, concession card holders, get free CGM. The majority of people have to pay for it. It's back, cool. So as you can see, they're, they are expensive devices. I'll let you guys read it yourselves. Um, can you read it? <laughs> I'll leave it up there. But essentially, we're looking upwards of five, six thousand dollars per year for continuous glucose monitors. They're cheaper on subscriptions. Like I said, you can chat with the reps about the cost. Now, it is a new metric, so it will take time to embed in clinical practice. So, not everybody's clinicians will be using time in range. And like I said, it is dependent on people using CGM and flash glucose monitoring. Uh, there is some emerging literature showing the link between time in range and long-term complications as well. So it is still an emerging field, but as research comes out, it will show that there, there is a link. Because it does link in with HbA1c. OK, so looking at the future, What's coming? So Dexcom G7, Medtronic Guardian Sensor 4, Freestyle Libre 2 and 3, and also Eversense, which is a, a novel one we'll talk about. So G7 first. So I know we've only just got G6, but G7 form factor will look more like the Libre. 
and it will be completely disposable. So smaller, and it will also have direct watch connectivity, which I know a lot of people would like. 14-day wear, so increased wear time over the G6, and a shorter warm-up time as well. Okay. Now, I don't have secret inside information. This is all stuff that's freely available on the internet. Medtronic Guardian Sensor 4. So we've got Guardian 3 at the moment. So the Guardian 4 was announced in October at one of the European conferences. It'll have the same design as the G3. It's got the project name Zeus. Okay, so if you have a look through the internet, if you type in Zeus sensor, you'll probably find some information on it. But essentially the additions over the Guardian 3 is it'll have no calibrations and you'll be able to make treatment decisions off that sensor glucose like you do with the Dexcom. Okay, so lunchtime, don't have to do a finger prick, you can just use the sensor glucose. Libre. Now I can't take credit for the picture, so this is from Nerdabetic. So he's a UK-based diabetes tech blogger. He has YouTube videos and all sorts, so you can keep abreast of technology developments with type 1 diabetes and diabetes in general on his uh, YouTube page. He's also on Instagram and Twitter and everything. But basically what they did was just cut down a Libre sensor showing what the size of the Libre 3 will look like. So Libre 2, same form factor as the current Libre sensor. It'll just have the addition of optional alerts. Okay. So what it will do, you set your high and low alert limits and your phone will beep. You physically still have to scan to get the glucose reading though. Okay. It's not available in Australia yet. It is available overseas though. The Libre 3 will be the size of two five cent pieces stacked on top of each other. So super, super tiny. Uh, same wear time, 14 days. It will be continuous, like all the other sensors. So they're moving away from the, the scanning or the flash glucose. So it will measure every five minute, every one minute and send that reading to your phone. You'll get those high and low customizable alerts as well from it, okay? Now, Abbott do have an agreement with Tandem, so there is potential in the future for the Libre 3 to be used with, say, Control IQ or the T-Slim pump. This one's quite exciting, Eversense. So it's an implantable CGM. Okay, so just like you'd insert an implant on, it just goes under the skin, it's the size of a Panadol pellet, it sits there and stays there for six months. So you don't have to put a sensor in every seven, 10, 14 days, okay? Now, you do need a healthcare professional to put it in for you though. That's, that's the key there. Now, it Bluetooths to your phone and it has a detachable transmitter which sits just above the sensor. So the transmitter will vibrate if you have a high or low alert as well as your phone will vibrate. Now, you still need to calibrate it twice a day and there's no Australian distribution at the moment. So ever since in the US, I think they've got a partnership with Roche, so Potentially, Roche may bring it to Australia. We just don't know. Like I said, crystal ball. This is all hypothetical. So this is just my CGM checklist. It may be the same or different to what you guys want. Just smaller, cheaper devices. Don't have to calibrate them. They last longer. You don't have to be without your readings for as long. So a shorter warm-up period, which we some of them do have an hour warm-up, which is nice. Accuracy is improved. One press insertion would be nice. You just got to press one button. The insertion on some of the devices can be quite fiddly and complicated and less irritation from tape, so more biocompatible uh, tapes or stickers. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk about pumps next. The crux of it. Every pump on, the on that screen there does the same thing. They all do the same thing, fundamentally. They're all pumps that pump insulin. It's just the user interface that's different. Okay, and so it's personal choice. They all have a basal rate. You put a carbohydrate ratio into it, put a sensitivity factor in, you customize your alerts, you change a reservoir, put insulin in, the rechargeable, have a battery. You might be curious about the top left corner. 
So that's the Roche Solo pump. It hasn't really officially been launched in Australia yet, but it will be the first patch pump to come to market. Uh, tubeless, so you're not tethered by a tube. Now, some people know overseas they've got Omnipod, which is a, a patch pump. The reason that never came to market, it got approved, but never came to market because it doesn't meet the funding models in Australia. So because it's a completely disposable device, the healthcare funds wouldn't fund it, essentially. So the way Roche have got around that with the Solo is there's a, a durable component and a replaceable part to it. Okay. Now, they've done a soft launch, but it hasn't officially been launched in, in Australia yet. So, to get more from your pump, you've got to wear a sensor, unfortunately. So when you wear a sensor, you get access to new features. Otherwise, the pumps are blind. They don't know if your glucose is high or low unless you tell it. So they just sit there going, la, 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 insulin, la, 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 insulin. They don't know what's going on. So you, you add that sensor in, you give the pump visibility. So first generation, we had this uh, threshold suspend. So Medtronic suspend on low. So if it hit, you hit a predetermined low limit, it would cut the pump off, okay? Didn't prevent a lot of, well, reduce some of your hypos, but you also had to turn it back on yourself. Now, the benefits of these, this sensor augmented technology, we see with minimal increase in our HbA1c, a reduce, reduction in the variability in the hypo risk. So moving on from the suspend on low features, we've got suspend before low. So we've had the Medtronic and now also the T-Slim with the Dexcom G6. So what we do in our clinical practice is with the Medtronic pump, we set our low limit at 3.4. So then if the pump pumps on the lookout for a hypo, anytime you drop below 7.3, if it predicts you're gonna drop below 4.5 in 30 minutes, turns the basal off. When you're above 4.5 and predicted to be above 5.6 in 30 minutes, it turns the insulin back on for you. So your minimum suspension times 30 minutes, maximum two hours, okay? Now, the T-Slim with basal IQ works slightly different to that, and you will likely see more suspensions throughout the day. Now, it doesn't have a customizable threshold for the suspend, unlike the Medtronic. It literally, if it predicts you're gonna be below 4.4 in 30 minutes, turns the insulin off for you, okay? The, uh, the cool thing though, is you tend to see less rebound hyperglycemia because let's just say your glucose was 3.9. If the next glucose level was four, it turns the insulin back on. So the minimum suspension times five minutes, maximum is two hours in a two and a half hour period. So you can sit there, suspend 3.9, next glucose is four, turns it back on. If the next one's 3.9 again, it'll turn off. If the next one's four again, it turns back on. So it can toggle on and off, minimum five minute time, time frame. Yes. No, no, you're right. Yeah. 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 So you only use short acting, rapid acting insulin. So there's no Lantus or Optichlin as it's called now. Uh, you literally drip that fast acting insulin in over the whole day. Yeah. And some of them, the hybrid closed loops, they can automate that delivery for you. Okay. But no, good question. Okay, next thing we'll talk about is the hybrid closed loop technology. So the Medtronic 670 was the first to market. So it's the first commercially available hybrid closed loop system. It uses the Medtronic Guardian sensor. The pump controls the basal rate and it controls the sensitivity factor. The only two things the user can adjust are the carb ratio and the active insulin time. Now, this technology, it targets a glucose of 6.7 and you might say, oh, that's too high. 6.7 equates to a HbA1c of 5.8, just to put it into perspective for you. So you're not gonna see a flat line. That's an unrealistic expectation, but literally the glucose level goes up, it gives more basal. Glucose level drops, less basal or no basal. So it reduces the variability, increases the time in range. That's the aim of the technology. Now, it has that fixed target of 6.7, uh, the correction target's 8.3, so some people do find when they're giving a correction, the dose is smaller, it takes longer to come back down into target range. 
the reasoning behind that is we're trying to reduce the variability. So you, you don't want to go from one extreme, be high, and then cause a hypo. So the corrections target 8.3, and then the basal takes over to gently drop you back down to that 6.7 target. That's its aim. Now, we've just had the 770 released, and if you're interested in that, you can have a chat with the reps. Same algorithm as the 670, just the addition of Bluetooth. So the parents in the room will be happy with this. It allows follow, it's got a follow feature, okay? So you can follow your kids via an app. So Bluetooth, you get the app, the user gets the app. So it's almost, it's pretty much a mirror of what's happening on the pump. You just, you can't deliver any insulin from the app, okay? So it's just for visibility. Also, with the Bluetooth, we get access, and this is a game changer for us as healthcare professionals, automatic pump uploads through the phone. Yay. So kids, we don't have to upload your pumps before clinic appointments anymore. It does it for you. That's, that's huge. Cool. Now, I'm going to have to scoot along pretty fast here. So essentially, it's got the addition of Bluetooth. Now, what we tend to see with hybrid closed loop technology, we're flipping our model of treatment on its head. So we've gone from a model of these arbitrary fixed basal rates with variable glucose levels to a model of more stable glucose levels with variable insulin delivery. So it's more physiological. It's what a pancreas would do itself. And literally, again, same person. All we did, black line is the glucose. Pink line is the basal. Bottom, we just turned auto mode on. So you can see the basal starts to increase and decrease based on what the, sen the sensor is telling the pump and as a result, more stable glucose level. I'll skip over that slide, because it's just reinforcing the previous one. Now, the impact of technology. You can see our little blue box. That's our 70% time in range. We, with pump alone or sensor alone technology, we're, we're moving from sort of 40, 45% time in range up to 50 to 55%. It's really difficult to get past that 60% time in range without some form of insulin automation, so a hybrid closed loop technology. Now, this is, these are clinical studies. Some of you may get that 70% and higher with what you're doing, which is great, but this is just clinical, clinical data. Okay, quickly, what's coming? So we've got control IQ with the T-Slim. So it's got TGA approval, it got prosthesis listing very recently. There's no release date yet. But essentially it's going to be similar to the Medtronic auto mode, but it'll also have automatic corrections uh, every hour if you're above target. Now it doesn't have fixed glucose target, it has fixed glucose targets, so it'll aim for 6.2 to 8.9. If the glucose is gonna be above 8.9, it increases the basal. If it's gonna be below 6.2, it decreases the basal. If you're going to be below three, it will suspend the insulin. And if you're going to be above 10, it will give you that automatic correction, dependent on G6. You still need to bolus, okay? So it's not set and forget. Medtronic 780G. Now, this is essentially what we're going to be doing our study on. So it's the next advanced algorithm from Medtronic. So it uses Israeli uh, AI tech. Now it's got a customizable glucose target, so you can go 5.5, 6.1, 6.7. Corrections will target 6.7 and not 8.3. And it can give an automatic correction every hour you're above target as well. Okay. Now just to show you, I did some snooping on Facebook. This was someone in America. They had 60 grams of carb, didn't bolus, went up to 13.9, and with those automatic corrections, the pump was able to bring them down. So they didn't actually bolus. I can't encourage that, but if you do struggle with bolusing, you might find this sort of technology quite useful. Okay. Now, just quickly, dual hormone pumps. So a lot of the pumps we see at the moment are single hormone, so insulin. But type 1 diabetes, we see insulin deficiency, but there's also inappropriate glucagon secretion. So the, you will see some pumps coming out which have dual hormones. So we use insulin to lower the glucose, glucagon to raise the glucose, okay? They've been limited by not having a stable form of glucose. And they've got this new form of glucagon called uh, Dazzy Glucagon, which they're doing some phase three trials on this year. So hopefully this sort of technology will be available within the next couple of years. There is no release date for Australia at the moment. Okay, Oop. pimp your pump. Okay, 
Now, we're moving towards interoperability, so we're going to have pumps where you can literally, and technology where you can pick what you want and whatever meets your needs and it'll all work together. So we're going to have these new device classifications, ICGM, ACE pumps and I algorithms. So ICGM, the only one at the moment is the Dexcom G6, but literally, as I said, think about it, you might have a Medtronic pump running a tide pool loop control algorithm with Dexcom G6 in an ideal world. The reps may not be happy about that, but <laughs> um, it's going to give you guys more choice, essentially. So you've got to pick what meets your needs. Now, I'll talk briefly about DIY technology because it's out there. People do use it. It has faster innovation because it doesn't need to go through regulatory approval. Now, there's three main branches of DIY. We've got Loop, we've got Android APS and Open APS. They all do similar things, but they're essentially hybrid closed loop systems. So the key is they're experimental. You have to set it up yourself. We as healthcare professionals cannot endorse or promote the use of these technologies, but if you do use them, you will still receive your routine care in the clinics that you, you see your healthcare professionals, but we won't be able to help you troubleshoot or uh, the use of the device or the system is up to you guys, okay? But they do use existing bits of technology, old Medtronic pumps, iPhones, and Riley links for the, for the loop system. Okay. If you're interested, there is a Diabetes SA position statement on their website regarding DIY tech. And finally, diabetes therapy and technology advances have improved outcomes over the last 20 years, but the work to achieve these outcomes hasn't yet reduced, and we may have actually increased the workload in the interim. Our next challenge is to uh, reduce the burden by closing the loop with these hybrid closed loop technologies. And I like to think of diabetes as a very, it's an inherently unstable condition, and it's like playing golf, but you're expected to hit a hole in one every time, okay? And hopefully tech will make it easier for us. That's it, guys.